It always annoys me in sci-fi when people have giant monolithic spacefaring empires. This empire, as seen in Star Wars, Firefly, Warhammer 40k, etc., always spans thousands of planets under a broadly similar centralized administrative structure. My first reaction is always, damn, if Italy is trouble holding together, what about a 3,000 planet empire? Also, if the state of Texas has at least four subcultures, why does everyone on this planet speak the same language? This is a collaborative video of futurist Isaac Arthur about what's a plausible model for the colonization of space. I'm an expert in history, which comes with some advantages since human nature and the laws of war, power, ethnography, and stuff like that changes very slowly, but it does come with other disadvantages, namely technology and the real changes that the future brings that he specializes more in. Thus, the two of us are working together to try our best to create an accurate picture of what power and governance among the stars, or at least planets, might look like. This video is part of a series with part one being on Isaac Arthur's channel, and you should check that out in addition to watching this. So let's get started and see what geopolitics among the stars would be like. A pivotal part of the colonization of space could be asteroid mining, which would provide financial incentives to go into space as well as being a relatively easier first step towards creating permanent off-world colonies. I was watching an interesting documentary at the possibilities for asteroid mining called Asteroid Mining, the New El Dorado, which talks about how the rarity of the aptly named rare earth minerals is currently causing states and large companies to invest in the potential for asteroid mining. There's even the possibility that out of this competition could come the answer for our energy crisis. I was able to watch this on Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers that has the richest history content of any streaming service. It also has a variety of stuff such as futurism, science, like this documentary, or history, folklore, geopolitics, and the stuff we generally talk about on this show. Honestly, Magellan's a great place to start learning about anything. Magellan's compatible with basically any device and is 4K with no additional cost. Click the link in the description to start learning about whatever inspires you today. Colonizing space, at least in the near future, would be deeply expensive. You realistically need a country or a coalition of countries with populations over 100 million people and a massive economic base. There are only a couple countries in the modern world capable of this as of now. The most likely and obvious option by a truly massive margin is the United States. As the world's largest economy with 300 plus million people and effectively pulling on Canada, Mexico, the Antipodes, and partially Western Europe as economic and political feudatories. The US is the largest capital market in the world for funding this sort of thing and is on the cutting edge of technology. It also has a pioneer spirit bred into it of massively expanding for its first few centuries. To be frank, Americans are really not comfortable not expanding, and space is what's left after Wyoming and Alaska. The second option is obviously China. China is the world's second largest economy, has tremendous amounts of capital, a good technology sector, a big population, and massive industrial abilities. China is the most outgoing of the great powers today, forging alliances around the world and investing tremendous amounts around the world, and is also currently looking into space. After this comes Russia and India, both of which have the raw ability but several mitigating factors working against them. Russia is effectively broke and significantly economically weaker than either China or America having a smaller economy than two American states individually. Russia, however, has a pre-existing space system and punches far above its weight in scientific and military ability. India, meanwhile, is the demographics and economy, but India hasn't really done anything aggressive or expansionist in its entire history. Meanwhile, its government's normally torn apart by so many special interests that forming something like a space colony program might be difficult. Finally, we get to fourth tier players. The European Union totally has the size and capital to fund a space program, but like the Indians has no record for aggression or expansionist acts. If the European Union can't deal with Yugoslavia, the 2008 financial crash, the Ukraine crisis, or Greece that resorting to the Americans, they're not going to have a space program. It would likely turn into a conflict between the Germans and the French who would be paying for it and countries like Italy, Spain, and Cyprus that would want proportionate representations of their populations who would be lacking in the scientific and technical skills necessary for space colonies. Or arguing for proportionate divisions of the revenues from asteroid mining even though they'd not be putting proportionate spending in. You also might get powers that could come into existence later in the 21st century here. It's become a meme on this channel how I think Turkey will unify the Sunni Middle East and become a superpower, and I still stand by it. Maybe Japan could build a coalition of East Asian countries or Brazil finally gets its act together. These are all potential players in a sort of black swan sense. Remember, before we continue, that black swans are the norm, not the exception, across history and basically everything else. 
The colonization of space is expensive, and it's very difficult to make it financially worthwhile. However, I do think humanity will end up colonizing space, and it becomes tenable for a series of reasons. The biggest one's asteroid mining, which is so ridiculously lucrative as to create the potential to effectively end resource scarcity for any mineral. There's so much gold in asteroids in our general proximity that we could be sitting on gold chairs in a century. It'll be interesting to see, and I consider this likely for a short period of time, that a sort of mineral rationing so gold and other markets don't collapse. But considering the frailty of human nature and discipline, I consider this in the long term unlikely. The first stage of the colonization of space will likely come in the form of asteroid mining, using robots and then gradually moving towards having human colonies. In the same way that the English and the French fished off the coast of Newfoundland to New England for over a century before putting settlers there, and the fishermen set up a network that the first settlers could rely off. This already brings up an interesting factor that we're already starting to see. Elon Musk is trying to colonize Mars as a private company, yet there's no way he doesn't directly or indirectly hand power over to the US government. This is similar to how a lot of colonization works, with the British colonizing India with the East India Company, or the Dutch South Africa with the VOC, well, in reality, they were working very closely with their governments. This is since the companies are a good way of concentrating talent on the people who want to work on the project and raising capital since investors want to be paid back, which doesn't occur with governments. Similarly, companies can do things governments can't. The East India Company committed absolutely horrific atrocities and corruption that the British government itself would never have gotten away with. The second major driving force towards colonization could be military worries. There's no question the next major war will be fought in space. We already have the weaponry to strike down enemy satellites, and they're so integral to our civilization that they'd be fought over. Once one military power is in space, there'll be an escalation for the rest to outcompete them. This sort of thing's ridiculously common in the history of colonialism. For example, no European government benefited economically from the colonization of Africa, but it was triggered by French expansion due to loss of pride from their losses in the Franco-Prussian War. This made the British want to expand up the Nile and Niger to prevent the French from getting too powerful, and then the Belgians opportunistically took the Congo, which sparked the Germans and Italians. In other words, if the US colonized parts of Mars, China and India will have colonies on within the next 10 years. A major factor here is that space has no population, and so there's no side of the debate that people are getting hurt, which is important in modern politics. Colonizing large parts of space might be a good way for governments to let off steam and signal how powerful they are. Imagine how much patriotism it would induce if half of Mars is put on American maps. Similarly, a final motivator towards the colonization of space would be ideological. I have lots of friends who are tech CEOs, and it's interesting how much colonization of space is a near-religious issue for them. Most of them would be willing to take significant losses to colonize space. If you polled young males, a significant majority would likely want to colonize space at a loss. These are generally for the same ideological and emotional reasons than a lot of wars are fought. The Romans conquered Britain largely for glory, since there was no economic or political reasons that it would make sense for them to do so. Similarly, empire was extremely popular in late 19th century Europe, and crowds in Britain, France, Spain, or Italy would cheer as new territories were added to the empire. However, on the other side, you also get people who don't want to colonize space out of principle. I hear the argument a lot that we shouldn't colonize space, since that money should go to deal with global warming or the poor. This ignores that the colonization of space wouldn't be super expensive, and if you want money to help the poor or global warming, there are other massive expenses like the healthcare or military in the US that you could cut. Also, that the colonization of space could help the environment by, say, building giant solar panels in space or giving poor people opportunities in the colonies and expanding wealth of more resources. However, similarly to the pro-space colonization people at all costs, the anti-space position fills a more religious, societal role than anything else. When you get down to it, the colonization of space and the massive costs incurred only make sense if there's an ideological position behind it. The sort of demographics that would colonize space are heavily dependent upon local conditions, but I can use some of the rules from previous colonies in history to try to predict how they'd turn out. For now, let's just assume conditions that allow easy mass migration of millions of people, and I'll use the US as an example of society since that's what I and most of my audience are most familiar with, but you can apply similar patterns to other countries. Firstly, ethnic minorities have been overrepresented in colonies. You saw this in the British colonies with the Scots, Irish, and Welsh, and in the Spanish with the Basques, Muslims, Jews, or Asturians. In an American colony, racial minorities would be overrepresented. This might be mitigated by the second law that the middle classes, and especially the lower middle classes, are always overrepresented since they have the money to travel, which would likely be expensive for a journey to another planet, but also don't have enough to be tied to their location. This pattern of ethnic minorities and middle class would mean that Asians would be very overrepresented, and African American numbers would go down. 
Also, in an American colony, expect large amounts of Europeans if the Europeans didn't have a colony of their own, possibly numbering on 25% of the American colony's population. This is similar to how talented Europeans often end up in American science, cultural, and business spheres. Also, a possible group to look at are digital nomad and expat communities who are decently good proxies for the people with the adventurous spirit that'd be willing to colonize space. This is a large white nation community that's educated but not making a great living at home and so work remotely in a cheaper country. Truth be told, the time lag between a planet like Earth and Mars is not massive enough to prevent people from working remotely from Mars. Special interest groups are also overrepresented in these migrations, with political radicals forming most of the U.S. In a Martian colony, extreme conservatives and liberals would self-select to move into the same colonies and enter into insane echo chambers, in the same way that Virginia was the representation of the fantasies of royalist gentlemen, while New England that of a Puritan fanatic. People would cluster into colonies of like-minded people. Expect hardcore conservatives, left-wingers, African-Americans, and probably some group I'd never think of like the Mormons to have their own colonies. Colonies also tend to be time capsules of the societies they formed from in those eras. 17th century Britain was very capitalist, religiously fanatical, obsessed with freedom, having killed their king, and was really mobile and crusading. And America 400 years later is still all those things. 16th century Spain was hierarchical, aristocratic, based off exporting goods to better developed regions and intellectually starved, as is modern Latin America. To be real, the Terrans from StarCraft are actually a pretty accurate representation of what an American space colony looked like in 500 years. Corporate and capitalist, gun-loving, obsessed with freedom, aggression, etc. It's interesting that the Terrans speak with a southern accent, given that the accent that became the modern American accent was a rustic North English accent that a 17th century Englishman would have laughed upon hearing it become a standard accent of authority of the most powerful nation in the world. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, where I've got parts of my history of the world and cultural history of America. Or click the links in the description to check out my Twitter or Instagram. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.